doing now. You'd think after doing a hundred of these bloody things, five that I'd, um, I'd figure out how to actually do it all at the, at the same time. Uh, for those first timers, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Advice Movement's free webinars. We have the Don Steve Browning on the other end. Say hello to the lovely people, Steve. Hello, lovely people. Lovely to uh, have you all here. And you know, he's a good guy because his name is Steve. Now, while we're waiting for everybody else to arrive, I'm just going to show everyone how crappy the Melbourne weather is today. And shout out in the, uh, in the chat box. Let us know where you're dialing in from. We've hopefully got a couple of international guests uh, some US planners joining us today, mate. So no, uh, very exciting. No pressure, but you know you've gone global. Uh, okay. Let's let's see if I can get this thing. See if I can get this thing out the window without wrecking. Yeah, Steve, don't destroy the weather. Really happy that I've just decided to go off the cuff with um, with what's going on. So let's have a look at how crappy. Oh, it's hideous. And literally yesterday was thirty five degrees, and I was in the pool with the boys, and now we are. In a, uh, in a really crappy lot of Melbourne weather. So let us know where you're dialing in from, whether your weather, whether your weather, do you like that, is better than ours. Um, and uh, and we, will, we will start momentarily. We do always like to politely let a few people, do I want a cyclone? Okay, fine. Thanks, James Wortley and our North Queenslanders that always have the ability to make us feel sorry for them. Mate, you chose to live up there. Don't blame us, right? Yeah. You could you could move to the rest. You could move to suburbia like the rest of us. Uh, Luke Reg Grundy's joining us from sunny Perth. Always sunny in Perth. Hope you're going to enjoy the cricket. Um, uh, Andrew's in Adelaide. Sheila is in Sydney. Uh, Catherine's in Canberra. Uh, so we do have some people. And Simon's in Sydney as well. So we've got some people dialing in from everywhere. Um, we will kick off in about a minute's time. For those of you that haven't joined us on a, on a webinar before, again, welcome. Um, the way it works is we'll record the session, so if you have to bail at any stage, that is fine. We strongly encourage you to use the Q&A box. Fire your questions through, and if it's appropriate, I'll interrupt Steve, as he's used to me doing now, um, and ask him a timely question. Otherwise, we might save it to the end. Uh, and please use the chat box as well. Um, to let us know what is going on. Um, without further ado, I think I'm going to bring our slides up. I'll just go screen two. And with some feedback that we've, I've taken on board from previous sessions, Steve and I are going to spend this whole session about talking about masterful moves and strategy. Um, we're not going to do any self-promotion of our, of anything that we've got going on until the last couple of minutes. So, uh, I'm going to make this all about you as much as we didn't think the last ones were about us. But anyway, we've listened. Um, it's, it's all about you guys. Uh, I'm not sucking it up. I promise. Uh, okay. So now the, the Don, have you got, uh, can you see that slide on your end? I can perfectly clearly. Awesome. So what I was going to, I'm going to drive. The Don's going to talk. It's what he does best. Look, I said in the blurb before uh, in the facey blurb, um, I found strategy really hard to get my head around. Like I've always sort of been the sort of person that goes, I'm just going to get off my ass and do this stuff. Uh, and it's not that hard. You know, we'll figure it out as we go. But the reality is to do it properly, it is quite, it can be quite difficult until I met this bloke and he helped me sort of, uh, as he loves to say, get some, uh, get some focus and some clarity on what it is that I was trying to do. And initially when he started weaving his spooky strategy magic. I thought it was going to be just like all the other bloody strategy coaches, which is banging on with a bunch of high level bullshit that doesn't actually apply to a small business. Uh, you know, it's all good and well in the worlds of Wharton and Harvard and all the, the strategy lands. But what does that mean for a, a little old punter down on um, in Bay street in Port Melbourne? Um, and now I sit here bringing him live back to you. For those of you that haven't seen, he's seen him in, um, in full flight before, this is going to be absolutely one of the best ones. The Don, Steve, and his strategy logic is one of the best things we've ever brought into experience. Wealth, not just at a, at a top leadership level for me, more for the team, to get the team to understand what was rattling in and around up here with me. Um, and also to get me to bloody focus and decide that you don't need to do everything all the time, but what you do decide to do, you need to execute on it. And it's a combination of um, not just gut logic. I think financial advisors for way too long 
we've either done what the bloke that's next to us that looks okay, we've either done and copied what he's done and just hope that it works for us or we've used our own gut logic and run on some ideas that are just really stupid and I've got a crap load of them and Steve's not going to share any of them because I'm infallible. Um, we just run on stuff for way too long. And so today, Steve's going to share just a little bit of um, the absolute vault of knowledge around um, strategy and startup. And it's, it's, I think it's really, really timely because everybody, especially those of us in Australia, we know come the end of February next year, once the Royal Commission hands down their findings, our world is going to change yet again. And we need to be strategically thinking about what we're going to do to ensure our businesses are successful, whether we're starting up, starting again, starting out with somebody else. Um, this is what it's all about. So I'm going to hand over now to the Don. I'm going to turn my video off. I'm still going to be here in the background, unfortunately, for those of you that wish I would leave. Um, but for now, it's over to you, mate. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, great to, uh, to have you being a part of this today. Look, as Steve has suggested, uh, for a lot of people, strategy is a bit of a mystery. And for many, thinking about what future success looks like is great. And we do that from time to time. But the reality is that every day we walk through the swinging doors of our, our saloon, we're faced with, uh, you know, the typical issues of the barroom brawl, if you like, the whirlwind that goes on around us from a day to day perspective and that makes it pretty difficult sometimes to stay focused and stay clear on on what it is we really want to become and what it is that's really important and and the things that really matter um, to be successful in the future the reality is the choices we make today um, are pretty much going to bake uh, what our success looks like into the future so it's really really important to uh, lift our heads up um, and think about some stuff um, that's really, really important. Uh, over and above all the stuff we've got to do on a day-to-day -day basis in our businesses, which is critical as well, but we actually do have to carve some time out. So today, in an hour or a bit less than an hour, I'm gonna cover a fair bit of ground, but hopefully from what I'm going to share with you today will we'll help you uh, not just think through, but choose and do the things that actually uh, matter for your future success. Along the way too, I, hopefully I can demystify the whole thing around strategy and also um, give you some tools that you can take away and you can start working on. In fact, there's gonna be a whole bunch of action items as we walk through some of this stuff as well. So I want you to take those away and maybe have a crack at those in the first instance, which will help you set up um, some of the things that you, you wanna do, some of the choices that you need to make as you start going forward. Um, so today, obviously we want to uh, understand um, the six strategy choices that you need to make. And that's as difficult as this exercise of strategy is for you. There's lots and lots of ways to look at strategy, but I can tell you uh, this approach and methodology works. I've done this now with over 100 businesses, I guess, in the last six years. Uh, it works. Um, and so it's six choices, and I'll take you through each of those as we go through today. Uh, key concept around some of this stuff is how you're going to win the client value equation, not how you win it today, but also how you're going to win it in the future um, with those you choose to work with. Uh, and this is a key concept. And if you can get this, if you understand how this bit works, might just change the way you think about your future success forever and, and what you need to do from this point onwards to maybe get there. We also want, uh, want you to think about what your business wants to be or wants to become over the next five years. Um, Often when I talk to businesses and the leaders of firms and, and talk to them about, tell me about what the business looks like in, in three or five years time, often the response is around um, all of the things that they want to have at that point in the future. You know, I want to have X amount of revenue, I want to have X amount of clients, I want to have X amount of fun, I want to have X amount of, uh, of enforced premium business, I want to have these things. And, and so that's an interesting response in the mind of what you want to be. Uh, it's very different. What you want to be is what your guiding purpose, what your winning aspiration determines that your business is. And so the things that you end up with, the things that you have, are as a result of what you want to be or what you want to become. A subtle difference, but really, really important as we start to think, it through, think through what our future success 
will be. Also, what I want to talk to you today about and show you is how to win in multiple ways. So not just finding the right types of clients, but also how do we think about the right types of segments, advice segments or arenas that we want to play in as well so that we can win in multiple ways. And it's going to be critical for those who want to differentiate themselves from their competition going forward. Um, two of the key elements of, um, of your success will be where you choose to play and how you're going to win where you choose to play uh, as the basis of your future success. And we're going to explore that and show you how that hangs together. In particular, making those where to play and how to win choices as matched pairs, which is really, really, really critical. Um, we also then want to think about, well, okay, what are the capabilities of our firm need to be? So what capabilities need uh, do we need to have so that we can deploy them in the right way, in the right activity system? And I'll show you uh, an activity system uh, as we go through. So how do we deploy those capabilities which will allow us to win where we've chosen to play to deliver on our guiding purpose? Um, then we also, I want to show you how to actually think about and do manage what matters. Um, lots of stuff we get caught up in, in managing and taking care of, but there are some certain things that you need to manage that actually will matter to your future success into the future. And it's also around how you execute stuff. And I guess for the majority of firms that I work with, one of the key issues um, or, or, or short, shortcomings with the business is how they execute. Um, it's really, really common. It's really, really tricky in the eyes of a lot of businesses who are trying to do a lot of things. So one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is perhaps four key disciplines in execution, which will also help you manage, monitor and review a lot of your strategy going forward as well. And so on that point then, uh, what's the strategy activation plan, if you like, look like for you? There's a little tool I've included in, uh, in this presentation for you as well, which might help you with that. I've also got an example about um, how you might kick the ball into play in terms of delivering on your strategy. So these are the takeaways for today. Hopefully uh, you get some value out of it. Um, so let's plow through and, and have a look at what we're talking about. And before we, uh, before we kick into that stuff, Steve, why don't we, uh, uh, do you think it'd be a good idea to ask everybody what they're doing around or what they've done around strategy previously with some sort of impromptu poll? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good idea, Steve. Uh, so, guys, I'm going to launch the poll now. And, uh, and, uh, and those of you that have done the polls before, you know what is happening. Uh, we work on a participation. The advice movement is all about taking action, which means your thoughts are absolutely needed. So we need you voting on this stuff. If we don't get at least two-thirds of the vote through, um, then we don't move forward. Uh, it's just somewhere in between the Australian forced voting environment and the US voluntary voting environment. We want at least two thirds. So you should see that poll up there now. Um, and what we want you to do is go through and start clicking on those. So a lot of them are multiple, some of them multiple choice, some of them you've got to choose which one. This is really about helping us understand or, or Steve understand how you've developed strategy uh, in the past. So Don, do you just want to talk them through not so much the, the words that are on the page, but the, how you came up with these questions? Yeah. So um, it, it's really about where you're at now and, and what and how you're framing up your mind right now um, around your business and, and your strategy. And so what are the things that have framed in your head around what strategy is, how you've approached it in the past, um, what have been some of the issues? How do you feel about some of this stuff? Because once we understand where we're at at a baseline level, then we can start to think about, well, okay, um, here's my reality now. Here's what I've been thinking about. Here's what I might have been doing. Um, how do I now relate that to some of the things I'm going to talk about during this session? And how do I start to think about framing up uh, for the future, maybe in a, in a different way than the way that you've done it previously? All right, we are... We've got someone else has just joined us. There we go. We've hit our magical 75%. You guys are great. I love how you actually participate. And the five of you that haven't voted, I'm assuming it's because you are, you're driving a car and it's not safe to do so. But everybody else, thank you so much for voting. Uh, we'll close the poll now. Now it doesn't look like anyone else is getting their thoughts in. And I am just about to share those results. So Steve, can you let me know when you can see those on screen? 
Um, okay, let me just do this. So what we're going to do is just going to walk through. Um, we're just going to walk through the roughly what you can see from those results and hopefully you can see them there. Yep, I can, mate. Yep, absolutely. So what does that tell you? Is, is any of this stuff a, a shock to you or is it sort of what you thought? Yeah, no, really, it's, a, it's really interesting, actually, Steve. It really confirms what I see a fair bit. Um, little surprising, little surprising that the, um, you know, 20% perhaps haven't ever formally developed a strategy. I, I know by the look of the responses there around using a, a licensee business plan template um, and some have engaged a business coach cool um mostly obviously the largest response there around the 67 percent is uh they've just you know stuff's been ad hoc um and that's really really common um so i think that's a good starting point mate for for what we're about to go through because when we get to the end of this um there'll be no need to do anything in an ad hoc basis anymore and the other one so the second question you had 40 percent of people saying they that setting short-term goals and objectives is uh the statement that best describes how they've previously defined strategy. Yeah, which again is really interesting. Again, not surprising. I see this a fair bit. Um, strategy is around setting long-term goals and objectives. So to actually even consider or think about short-term goals and objectives being strategic is really interesting. Um, so setting long-term goals and objectives is really what strategy is all about. Yeah, we've got to pay attention to all of the stuff that's going on in the short term. And yes, we want to get from year to year, uh, delivering on our KPIs and our numbers. Um, but we've also got to take a view and have a position that the world exists beyond 12 months for us. So we also need to be doing some stuff, making some choices around, you know, timeframes three years out, five years out, maybe longer. Um, and that's what strategy is all about. And that last one uh, around which of the following best describes your current and previous strategy. Um, so I'm actually, I, I believe in this one as well, because I think before you and I did this work, I was very guilty of having a default strategy that very heavily tilted towards the serving client side of the equation and not so much worrying about whether or not that we were winning in the same process. Is that, is, is that fairly common as well? Yeah, it is. Um, it is very common. And I guess one of the distinctive bits about that is um, clients are clients. And that's what the way a lot of people think. They're just my clients. Yes, I've sort of segmented them. I've got, you know, I've got platinum clients at the top and I've got tin clients at the bottom and all of the segments in between. And I've got pricing strategies, you know, throughout the business on all of that. But the reality is that often we think about clients just as this big, big, whole big pool of clients. And when we think about doing things, it's about doing things for our clients. We've got to deliver that for our clients. We've, we've got to set this up for our clients. And it's, there's no real distinction around clients uh, in terms of their client type. But more importantly, which of those are our most profitable clients who should be getting the lion's share of our, our attention, the lion's share of the support, the lion's share of uh, all of the work that we do in our business. And so we'll touch on some of that, Steve, as well. But that's... That's a pretty common and, and interesting result. Um, and that I would have to say is, you know, they're responses that are probably for the majority of businesses out there, interestingly. Well, over to you, mate. I'll let you uh, keep kicking on and I'll jump back in, guys. Remember, keep hitting us up in the chat box if you've got any questions or, or use the Q&A function as well. And I'll be back about halfway through to, to uh, do another poll. Okay, so here's the mystery of strategy revealed. Um, strategy is simply about one thing. And that is making choices. That's it. You make the right choices, the well thought through choices, the sustainable, the robust choices in six key areas. And you're on the right path to um, delivering, uh, managing uh, and moving on towards succeeding with a really, really good strategy. That's as simple as it has to be. But the issue with it is, though, you need to be, and Steve alluded to it in the opening, you need to be focused and clear on what those choices are and how important they are as uh, interrelated choices. And we'll get to that shortly. So it's, it's how you be fiercely focused and crystal clear on what it is that you need to do. And I can tell you that any successful business you've, you've seen in the past, any successful business you would say is successful today and any successful business in the future will be fiercely focused and crystal clear on what it is it needs to, to do. 
And if we can start to really get to that point, then we're going to start to really hum and groove uh, and start to make some real acceleration towards where it is we want to be in the future. And, and this is all about uh, playing to win. I'm a big fan of Roger Martin. Some of you might be aware of his book, Playing to Win, I think is probably one of the best books on strategy ever written. Um, and he is really big on this issue is that you're in business and we're playing to win. Now we're playing to win in a certain way, um, but we're not playing to play. We're not just playing to serve. Um, playing to play, to me, in my experience now, um, working with a lot of firms, a lot of businesses, is the play to play is a great recipe for mediocrity. And we don't want to be mediocre. We want to play to win. We want to play to win with our clients. And we'll cover some of the issues around that going forward. But that's, that's really important to understand that we, we need to play to win. We need to win with our clients and we need to win against our competition. And there's going to be more and more competition in our world going forward. That's really clear. Some of whom we don't know what they look like yet, but um, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to cover off on. So um, next thing we need to understand is that as good as this stuff is, and as well as you might be able to implement things, there is no guarantees of your success. Um, what we want to do, though, with this material, with this way of thinking, this framework, is we want to um, increase your chances of success. Or if you like, shorten your odds of being successful into the future. And that's what this is all about. So what we're after is predictable and repeatable success in whatever shape or form that looks like for you and you'll get a chance to assess that as we go forward. Um, successful businesses in our world of financial advice, financial services going forward will um, also be nimble and agile businesses. Those businesses that have a strategy and are following that strategy and making the right choices and doing the things that are important, uh, the masterful moves, if you like, the things that they're working on, um, that will allow them to be agile and nimble going forward because you're going to need to pivot. You might be right now at that point in time where you have or have to or need to pivot. But certainly what we're going to see coming out of the Royal Commission and some of the other structural elements from a regulatory point of view going forward in our, in our world here, um, you're going to need to pivot somewhere, somehow. You're going to need to pivot because you'd want to choose to pivot at some point in the future. Um, but being agile and nimble is going to be the baseline, I think, of, of, a, of a business that's going to be successful. And this is one way I can assure you uh, of being agile and nimble. And at the end of this, what, what we want to do is bring, bring it all together in the, in the form of a one-page strategy document, which I've got a, a sample of for you at the end here. And, and that'll help you capture the essence of the key choices uh, for you into one page. And I'll talk to you a bit later on about how important that's going to be as Steve mentioned, not just for you as the leader of the business, but also for everyone that works with you in your business as well. So how do we frame up our mindset? Are we starting up? Uh, do we have a new partnership? Is, there a, is it a reinvigoration a new, uh, of a new entity um, or, or an old entity moving into a new iteration? Um, you start, need to start to think about, well, okay, what is it that we need to do and to think about at this point in time? The reality is that if you can make six key choices um, in an inter integrated framework, if you can make those six choices, then you have all of the components of a really good strategy moving forward. Um, what we're going to talk to you about is uh, the choices, obviously, and we're going to cover off on each. So the statements around your vision and your values and why they're really important, uh, if you like, to help guide us where we, we want to go. The guiding purpose, the winning aspiration, if you like, is going to set the frame then for the following four choices. And that sort of becomes the, um, the real essence of what it is you do and who it is you do it for. Uh, then we move into the choices of your where to place and your how to wins. Uh, and we're going to go into the detail of that. But importantly, we need to think about where we're going to play and how we're going to win in the context of the matched pairs. Not just having a really compelling where to play arena, uh, or just having a, a really a really strong how to win, a strong competitive advantage. What we need to do is have both. We need to have a, a really compelling where to play arena and a really strong matching how to win. And we'll cover off that as we go through as well. Then obviously what we want to do is have uh, investments into the capabilities that we need 
to deliver our, our how to wins. And so this is really about how do we play to our strengths and, and what strengths might we need to develop up? What, what muscle strength from a capability point of view do we need to build up along the way as well? And we'll talk about how you invest in, in that too. And then finally, how do we monitor, manage and review, review all of those capabilities that we've deployed, which will allow us to win where we've chosen to play to uh, achieve our guiding purpose and deliver our vision. So as you can see, all of the choices, if you like, in that cascade actually support and reinforce all of the choices um, above. And so the action item, I guess, if you like, from this particular slide is um, go away and have a think about what is the one strategic long term, okay, not short term, what's the one strategic challenge that you have in your business right now? So capture that um, and that will be, that will help us and help you in particular um, kick off some of the choices that, that you want to, to make going forward. So as we have a look at the next slide, we framed up our thinking, our, 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 um, our position, what we're facing into right now in our current model. One of the things that we want to think about is value. And, and this is a contentious issue for a lot of firms. What I see in a lot of businesses is that we start the conversation around value and around how the practice, how the, the owners, the partners see value because the owners and the partners and even the people working in the firm will have their own view of the value that they are delivering. And of course, every day we open the doors, every day we turn up, every time we talk to a client, every time we interact, we do all the things that we do in our firm, um, we are creating value. And, and value creation is absolutely important to the longevity of the business. It makes sense, right? We have to continue to find ways to create value. Really important. But if you want to be a real strategist going forward, if you want to be really successful going forward, what you need to think about is not just value creation, but value capture. So who's capturing the value that's being created? Now, we know that um, we think about uh, our business, our firm, um, and all of the stuff that we do to create value, all of the knowledge and the skill and the expertise we deliver into our processes, our systems, our advice giving, our service, all of that stuff that goes into creating the value. Um, clients are, are contributing to this value creation pool too. Um, and some would say in a range of ways, but the bottom line, clients are contributing dollars. Yep, they're contributing their fees. Uh, they're hard earned into the value creation pool whilst you're putting in all of the other good stuff that I just mentioned. Um, clearly, you put in, proportionally, just proportionally, you put in arguably the most value. Um, typically, when we look at the value capture pool, so all of the value that's been created, let's could now call it a value capture, who takes the value proportionally out of the pool. We've got to think about um, the reality, whether you, you can debate it, but the reality is that clients will, um, will capture, will take out most of the value from the value creation pool, call it a value capture pool now. And that's great, and that's what you want. You want your clients to be getting the lion's share of the value, that's why we're in business, that's what we're, we're there to do. But going forward, we're going to need to be smarter than that. We're going to need to think about how do we fairly and equitably share more of the value, perhaps what we might consider to be the disproportionate value that clients are taking away. How do we share that value capture more equitably with them? And from a strategic point of view, that's going to be really important for you to think about how you might do it. The way I'd suggest you think about doing it is this concept called how you win the client value equation. For those of you who've heard of it, you know how powerful it is, but it's really simple. And if you can get your head around it, it's going to change the way you think about the clients you work with going forward and what value really is. So it's really simple. As the slide now uh, up in front of you would suggest, there are two parts to it. The first part is the perceived value. That is the perception of value that your clients have of what you do for them. And it's basically what they pay you for. Yep, so it's your dollars in. Your client's perception of value of what you do for them is your money in the door, arguably. 
the higher your client's perception of value of what you do for them is, the more money they're paying you. And the lower um, the perception of value of your clients, what you're, do, what you're doing for them, arguably the, the less you're receiving. It's sort of a logic of how that works. But the only value that actually ever matters is uh, your client's perception of the value that you're delivering. And if you've got 100 clients and you poll the 100 clients, you probably, uh, and ask them a question, you know, what, what's the real value that we deliver here? They probably have 100 slightly different answers because everyone's perception of value might be slightly different. The second part of the client value equation then is uh, the cost to serve. So it actually costs you, the business, doesn't it? Something to deliver the value that you deliver. And so, and so that's money out. So the difference between the two, money in, perception of value, money out, cost to serve, is your profit. And so that's the difference between the two boxes that you see in that diagram. The art form going forward is, how do we, being strategic, being clever business operators in our new entity, um, in our new startup, in our, in our revised entity, how do we over time find ways to increase our clients' perception of value? So over time, the right clients who are prepared to um, work with you over a long period of time, who have emerging life needs, lifestyle needs over a period of time, who are going to look to you for support and advice um, over that period of time so that over time you can get the opportunity to increase their perception of value, for which, by the way, they will generally be deliriously happy to pay you more money because you've got that relationship with them. I'll then chime I'm in on this one, Steve, to help out because not every firm, I mean, the age old adage is, uh, especially in Australian financial planning firms, how do you make more money as a financial planning business? Will you charge more fees? Um, and if the value, and then deliver more value and they pay more fees. And that's always been the, the dumb logic that all of us have applied really for the last, I don't know, 20 odd years since the fee, well, 10 to 15 years since the fee model has been the predominant one. And I know for our US listeners, this stuff was, is probably a little bit further ahead of the curve than, than where you guys and girls are at now because you haven't had to make the, the evolutionary leaps of, of explicit fee for service like we've had to in Australia. Um, but is it possible, mate, that you could have other ways of defining value if you don't necessarily want to increase your fees or if you, don't, if, you, if you can't necessarily increase your fees because the market that you've chosen to play in, let's call it for us, Gen X and Gen Y, if the perceived value, i.e. what they're willing to pay, is at a lower level, are there other ways that you can extract value? You know, for us, it was turning the clients into a number, into a, a referral source that then grows the business and maybe sort of creating some downstream value through um, other aspects. Is, is there different ways to do it? So it's not always just about increasing fees? Yeah, and, and that's, that's a really good point, Steve. So a lot of people say, oh, Steve, this conversation is around increasing fees. Well, actually, it's not. Um, this is around finding more of the right types of clients. Whilst this client value equation works, for example, if you can increase the perception of value over time and you can over time also incrementally reduce the cost to serve, so too does your profit profile increase as per the diagram. And sort of that's where we want to get to. But the reality is it's not about increasing fees. It's finding more and not necessarily a lot more, but finding more of the right types of clients finding centers of influence or, or, or referral sources who can send you the right types of clients. Because the reality is that you can't win the client value equation with every client. That's the reality. As you said, Steve, um, some clients will pay to a point, there'll be a transaction, they're happy with that. And really, they're not that much interested in doing anything more with you other than that thing. But there are some clients with whom you want to work with over the longer period, over the longer time. And whilst pricing needs to be right you know it needs to be relevant um, to what you're doing the reality is working out what is it that your clients actually value why is it that they're actually paying you for what they're paying you and importantly what might they be prepared to pay a premium for into the future so it's not so much about the pricing but actually finding more of the right types of clients or how you can work um, in an extended way, more with those who you would consider to be your very best clients. In a minute, we're going to talk about identifying your where to play clients. 
And that's going to be critical to winning the client value equation. So Steve, absolutely right uh, in terms of um, other methodologies and other ways you can think about winning the client value equation, not just in pricing. We might just go, this, I think it's just turned into the Stephen show. So Stephen Hallam's asked the question. There are non-Steves non you are allowed to play uh, in this as well. So make sure you hit us up with questions. Uh, and I'm conscious that Don's only got about 20 to 25 minutes of talk time left. Look, if we, we probably run a little bit over and those that want to hang are more than happy to hang. Yeah. Um, but it is a good question, mate, because I think quite often um, this happens where if you increase your number of clients, that's all good and well. And Steve's, Steve Howland's basically said, but that also then increases your cost to serve. But, but right. your model's about having ensuring there's a profit margin that enables you to incrementally increase your profit whilst actually increasing clients and understanding the drivers behind that. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely correct. Yep. Yeah. So the idea is, um, what type of clients do you want to attract to your business into the future? Is it more clients who are maybe just transactional where there's less opportunity to win with them into the future? Or do you want to, uh, to continue to add certain types of clients that who are, who are your best clients today with whom you are today winning the client value equation? Do you want to attract more of those with whom you can add who you can also incrementally uh, increase um, you know, the value with over time. But the type of clients you attract into the future are going to be critical to um, your success because the reality is we can continue to attract all sorts of different clients, but for those that we can't win the client value equation with into the future, it's going to continue to be problematic as we average costs, as we average services, as we, as we average support across all of our firm to everyone in the business. And I know you've got segmented clients and I know there's service packages, but the reality is most firms just get really good at averaging stuff. So it's more about finding a number of the right clients, more of the right clients. And I'm not saying we're gonna jettison everyone else, not at all. You'll find ways to service and support those clients profitably as well, I'm sure. But our effort and our attention should be, how do we find a few more each year of the clients that we can win the client value equation with? And that's really important. So thanks for that, that question, that comment. Um, so first part, first choice, when I think about, um, I'm just conscious of time here. One of the things that we need to do is think about what our future looks like. And the reason that's important, a lot of people don't put a lot of emphasis on this. Some would say, no, no, Steve, uh, you, we put together a vision, but <clears throat> really, mate, it's just a, a motherhood statement. And you know what? For a lot of businesses, it is just a motherhood statement because the vision isn't actually then linked to any other strategic choices in the business. And so they do become a little bit of a motherhood statement. But where you've got a vision with some really strong core values and a really robust guiding purpose, winning aspiration, where you've got those linked into the, the following uh, three choices, uh, four choices in the, in the cascade, then it's a really powerful piece because at the end of the day, the vision becomes your guiding light. The vision is a statement around also, what's your audacious goal? What do you want to be in three or five years time or longer? What is it that we really want to head towards? What is it that we want to become? And so too, interestingly, uh, having really a, a strong set of core values. You don't need many of them, four or five or six maybe is, is what you want, but these core values actually um, form the basis of the culture that you have and or uh, are building in your firm. What are the things, the core values that, that we don't compromise on ever? No matter what happens in our business, these core values survive everything. Um, no matter whether we're going well or we're not going well, the core values survive. And so the vision and the values that you create for the firm will set you up, if you like, for the direction in terms of, of where you want to, to take the business. So around your audacious goal and the vision, around your core ideology. There's a sample we'll get to uh, at the end of the slide where I've put together a, a success statement for you, um, which is a sample, actually is sort of off a bit of a live version of of one of my clients. Um, you won't be able to identify who it is, I'm sure, but it'll give you the view. Um, so having the vision and the values is the really, really important first choice 
to how your strategy will play out. And as I mentioned, um, values, core values are culture defining. I get asked a question a lot in the work that I do with businesses around, you know, oh, uh, I think my culture needs some work. You know, and I, after asking a couple of questions and maybe being a bit observant these days, I can pretty much determine where the problem with the culture is uh, in a business. And to be honest, it's usually around the leadership. Um, and so what are the values? Are the values being lived? If they're not being lived, what are the consequences of, not, of the values not being lived? And actually who's leading and driving that? So the values become a really, really important part of the first choice that you make. And, and the next bit of sort of the defining your why, why your business actually exists and why it actually matters is coming up with your guiding purpose. Um, your winning aspiration, if you like, with clients. And that's another statement, but that's set up in such a way that um, it's more about what a client receives from you rather than a statement that talks about how good you are and what it is you do as a firm. And there's a subtle difference, but I can tell you it's a fundamental difference. Because if you've got the outcomes, how you win with your clients, how your clients actually win by doing business with you, that's a really, really important choice you make before you move into your where to plays and your how to wins. Um, there's a group, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me talking about it. Um, some of you might know him, Paul Carney, the Carney Group in Victoria. Uh, it was one of the first businesses, actually, I still work with, with Paul and, and the business. Um, one of the first businesses that I started working with, and um, he and his leadership team were really, really big on getting and crafting the guiding purpose. Um, and he came up with theirs, and, and I'll share it with you if you're interested in it. Um, the guiding purpose, the winning aspiration for Carney Group is to empower people to make a lifetime of great financial decisions. Um, so uh, impressed with that as a group when they came up with it, um, and, and as important as they really felt that was, uh, I reckon within a month of helping them draft that up, and it took a little while, but coming to... Getting to that, I landed at the office, walked into reception, and there I saw it painted in really large writing on the wall of the reception. And, and so that's just a sign, if you like, an indication of how important that was to Paul and the other uh, key choices that he made in his strategy. Interestingly, Paul has about five or six divisions, I think, now in his firm. He has a lending division, and the lending division have come up with their own um, winning aspiration, and it's linked to the overarching Carney Group winning aspiration that I've just mentioned to you. And theirs is to empower people to make a lifetime uh, of great financing decisions. So they've just changed one word in the overarching uh, guiding purpose to make it relevant to that particular division and the strategies that they have in that division. So. That's why it's really important to do it. It's to do it. It's important for everyone in the organisation to understand what it is, to know it, um, to be able to rattle it off, to live it and breathe it in the roles that they play and the jobs that they do. <clears throat> but importantly, it's also the guide, if you like, to those others in the business, particularly other leaders in the business, to set up in their own divisions, in their own business units, to help them with their strategy as well. So... Um, the action out of that piece then is to think about um, what you want your firm to become in the next five years um, based on the audacious goal. What is it that you might weave into that, that vision um, that is a bit audacious, it's, it's, it's a bit of a stretch, it's a bit hairy, um, that is something you want to actually stretch for, that you want to, you know, um, you want to hit a home run on. What, what would that thing be? So have a think about that and maybe draft something up. You know, what is it that you want your firm to become in five years' time? So before we move into the where to play and the how to win choices, which are arguably the heart of the strategy choices that you make, what you want to do is think some stuff through. Um, strategy is also around thinking some stuff through. Um, we want to understand what, what's the basis of our strategy rationale. Why is it that we will make the choices that, that we, we make, what will underpin our strategy logic. Um, and so there's four key business analyses that you'll, I'd suggest that you do. And I'm not gonna go into a great deal of detail about this now, but I want you to think about these four things. Firstly, around our industry and around our profession, um, 
what are the strategically distinct advice segments? And so start with all of the advice segments that you're in, that you're working in right now, so list those. But what are um, a bunch of the others that are also potentially linked to the advice segments that you're in, that you might not necessarily focus on right now, but what are, what's the longer list of strategically distinct advice segments? And once you've done that, then I'd like you to think about, go through each of them one by one, just with a high, medium and low ranking, but just say, okay, um, what's the structural attractiveness of this segment into the future? And by structural attractiveness, I mean, what is the profit potential for you, the business? What's the profit potential in that segment into the future? And again, high, medium and low ranking, it's just your view of the world. And into the future, think about it in a three to five year time frame. Um, what we want to be thinking about and what we want to be sure is that we are finding multiple ways to win. I mentioned this earlier. And that simply means not just finding the right clients with whom we can win the client value equation with, but we also want to find the right clients in the right segments, in the right arenas. And that's the double whammy. That's the multiple part of the multiple ways to win. Right type of client in the right segments. Um, because some segments uh, are going to change into the future in terms of their, their profit potential. And you need to think through what those might be. So what's um, an example, mate? Just, I mean, obviously um, you've got the, the, the quintessential retirees, pre-retirees, but that you're sort of going a little bit more, uh, as our Americans would say, niched on that. Niched, yeah. Um, the rest of us, that's niched because, you know, yeah. we, we, so, we speak so, the Queen's English. <laughs> someone's English. Um, here's the classic, right? And I see this all the time. Um, there are businesses who are in, um, the corporate super advice arena. Yep. Uh, perhaps have been for a long time and they're sort of making that work. If I was in a startup role, um, and I was thinking about all of the, the segments that I could, I could potentially play in and maybe link to my own knowledge, skill and expertise, corporate super potentially might be something I might consider. Now, um, I think, and, and I'm happy to take comments and feedback from the people in the webinar today, but um, I think there's going to be an enormous amount of pressure on businesses who might be able to eke out a really strong profit winning with their clients in corporate super into the future. There's a whole host of um, industry super fund uh, pressures. There's a whole host of uh, cost to serve issues. Uh, there's a whole host of getting the offers right, uh, being able to deliver, all sorts of things which I think are going to put pressure on that segment. So some will, will make, continue to make it work, I'm sure. But there's a segment today you might look at and go, you know what, there's a fair bit of profit in there today for me and for others. Three or five years down the track, I'm not sure about that. So just to be careful about, Steve, where you hit your, um, your value trailer to as a segment, as an arena. And that's one example of that. Um, some might say the self-managed super fund uh, arena is another one where not quite sure where the, the value is necessarily going to come from. There's a fair bit of pressure from a regulatory point of view in that arena now and, and not quite sure where that's going to land. Big question mark. So as you analyse some of those segments, you need to think about where the future profit potential will come from, which will help you then. Uh, frame up your focused and clear where to play choices. Client value, we've spoken about a little bit. What do your clients really value? In, and that is, what do your clients value such that they will continue to pay for? And more importantly, um, what do your clients value that they, mar they might even pay a premium for into the future? So really think that through uh, in terms of helping you frame up uh, not just your where to place, but perhaps your how to wins where you've chosen to play as well. So a little bit of analysis there would be good. Your relative position. So that's really how you stack up. Yeah. So how you uh, line up against your competitors and understanding who they might be. And in particular, the thing you want to think about here is your capabilities. The capabilities that you need, yeah, today, but the capabilities you need for the success that you want in the future. And how do you stack up? So if you were to identify, you know, a handful of your competitors, um, list a bunch of the capabilities that you have today and that you might need into the future. 
um, and how do you stack up? Uh, do it on a you know on a, a, a plus neutral negative uh, basis if you like, but how do you stack up? And the reason it's important to understand your relative position is that we also all have to understand that the competition is increasing, it's improving, and there's going to be some comp competitors in the next three to five years that aren't even competitors today. So we want to make sure that best we can, we've addressed and we understand um, where it is that we need our capabilities to be and what it is we need to invest in. And finally, touching on the competition, who is your competition today? And how are you competitive with them? What's unique? What's distinctive? What's your competitive advantage compared to them? And also thinking about, gazing into the hazy crystal ball, but who might be competitors for you tomorrow, and that is three or five years down the track, um, that aren't competitors today? And what might you need to think about there in terms of your strategy going forward? So that's a little crystal ball gazing. So the action out of this particular slide is, um, first off, first up, list the advice segments you believe will be structurally attractive. That is, have profit potential in them uh, into the future for your business going forward um, to help you start to think through this strategy rationale, if you like. Okay. Um, the heart of your strategy. This is it, right? If you, if, if you were to distill strategy down to a couple of things, it's just this. Where are you going to play and how are you going to win? And the choice of your where to play arenas and your competitive advantage, how to wins, is really, really important. Choosing your where to plays, focused and clear, uh, is critical. I get to a lot of businesses when we start to go through this exercise, we find out, we, we sort of establish initially that um, a business might be um, competing in maybe five or six or seven arenas, five or six or seven target markets. Um, well, you know, that's not really focused. There's probably one or two in that, in that bigger number um, that are really profitable, that are sort of the bread and butter segments or arenas for a firm. And the others are sort of, you know, we're just playing to play in those. And remember going back to the earlier comments about playing to play. We don't want to be mediocre in stuff. We actually want to be awesome in a fewer things rather than a lot more things. So one of the things we need to think about is where is it that we choose to compete to win? What gives us the unique right to win in our chosen arenas? And also that means by exclusion um, where we choose not to play. And I can tell you that that's as, that's as important part of strategy as it is choosing the places to play, is choosing not to play going forward. Again, not saying you jettison existing arenas right now. All I'm suggesting is your focus and attention needs to be uh, ramped up a little more to those where you choose to play to win, where you can win the client value equation effectively. And so... What is it in each of our chosen arenas that will allow us to win? What makes us unique? What makes us distinctive? What is our competitive advantage? Some of us are pretty clear on that. Um, some of us aren't too clear on that. Some of us have general things that we would go, oh, yeah, we have a really good end-to-end -end advice process and that's our competitive advantage. Well, maybe. Um, Often it's around, well, you know what, there aren't many firms who, who wouldn't say that they don't have a strong end-to-end -end advice process. So, you know what, you're sort of in the big bucket with others and you look a bit the same on that basis. The question is, what is it that is or will make us unique or distinctive? What will be our true competitive advantage into the future? And we need to think about that. So what we're doing here with our where to plays and our how to wins is coming up with matched pairs. Roger Martin talks a fair bit about this. You'll find an article online that he wrote about it. Um, how do we get matched pairs? Really strong and compelling, focused where to play arena, but also a really, really unique and distinctive how to win or how to win set for that particular chosen arena. And Steve just put up on the screen an example, and this is actually sort of a real example with a business that um, I work with. Um, and so... What that is, is their where to play arena, which is small to medium businesses. What they have done is been really specific about identifying the profile characteristics. 
the ideal profile characteristics of the businesses that they have, that they're clients today, but they're also profile characteristics of those that they want to attract to their business going forward. And whilst there'll always be exceptions to the rule on the profile characteristics, um, your success will come from how closely you stick to the profile characteristics, uh, not how many exceptions that you make. Um, so your success will come from how closely you stick to those rules, if you like, of the profile characteristics, not the exceptions. Without the profile characteristics, then pretty much everything's an exception. And now we're back to averaging everything that we do. We don't want to do that. We want to be really focused and really clear. So if we have a look at that, if we have a look at the how to wins, obviously what they've come up with is um, they want to continue to deliver um, their, I won't divulge their name, their XYZ business lifestyle package. So that's their uniqueness right now. That's their distinctiveness. And they want to continue that and perpetuate that. One of the things that they want to do, though, is expand what they have, what they're calling their business insurance program um, with uh, an, an entrepreneur's capability leverage. So uh, I won't go into the details of that. There's a bit of IP around it. But those two how to wins are absolutely unique to that particular where to play arena. They're distinctive. They're branded. There's IP attached to them. And no one of their competitors can really say, oh, yeah, we do that too. Well, actually, they don't and they can't because they're branded and um, the components of those packages are, are quite bespoke, quite unique um, in the marketplace. So that's how we've got to think about our where to plays and how to wins as matched pairs. The action item then from, from this particular choice or choices, the where to plays and the how to wins, um, Identify your most profitable advice segment today and your sustainable competitive advantage in that segment. Now, that might be tricky for some of you because you might go, shit, Steve, I'm not sure. I don't know what that is. Um, well, we need, you need to think about that. You need to think about what it needs to be going forward and how you might make that unique uh, and distinctive. So I'm happy to chime in, mate, on this one. Um, I think it's going to be a shock to everybody because I've obviously... Uh, worked with Steve and or he'd say vice versa. I feel like I taught him as much as he taught me. Um, that's a lie. But clearly ours, you know, with a Gen X Y target market, which is still quite broad um, for us, you know, the, the clear chosen how to win that we started probably, geez, 10 years ago was the whole budgeting and cash flow piece. And, and 10 years ago, no one did it. And now in Australia, every man and his dog does it pretty much. Um, so it's, we have to constantly push ourselves to go, are we unique anymore? Well, no, we're not. Are we distinctive? Probably because the vast majority of businesses still don't put it at the core of their offer, whereas we do. Does it mean we've got our decision right? No, not necessarily, but we've at least doubled down and we've got some research that, that underpins that. We, we measure why clients sign up for our fees we measure you know why they refer other people why they continue to pay the fees and everything keeps linking back to that so that's sort of just another example of of how you try and put the two together and that's obviously then why we decided to go and massively bolster our capability in this space again does it mean that it'll always be like that no but it, it just helped us move through because i know one of simon's questions was you know how quickly can we get to that answer of what do our clients look like and and how um, and what do they want from us? You know, it, it is almost the case, Steve, isn't it, that you go straight to the horse's mouth and just bloody ask them for too long. The financial advice and the financial planning profession has told clients what is good for them and what they should want and value, um, when in fact every other bloody industry does it the exact opposite. Correct. Yeah. Look, I think it's a really good point, um, Steve, um, that we make assumptions. We, as the practice owners, um, make assumptions about what clients value. Um, and it comes from our own perspective. Uh, if we go back to the thinking around what do clients really value, in the client value equation, it's their perception of the value that you're, you're delivering through what you do for them. Uh, and that's the only thing that matters. And we don't ask them often enough. And, and often when, when client surveys, client experience surveys are done, in my experience, uh, with this, the responses, if the questions are asked and framed in the right way, the responses are actually very surprising to uh, the practice because uh, many responses will be, no, I didn't, I didn't think that that's what they really valued. I thought they really valued this stuff. Um, and so that's going to help us frame that up. And, and again, understanding 
what it is and why these clients pay for what they get um, is probably some there's some clues in there to as to what it is they they are going to value and then how it is you can frame up your how to wins um, going forward. But remember, trying to frame up a whole bunch of how to wins across seven um, where to play arenas is really tricky, really difficult. If you've only got maybe one or two or three where to play arenas, it's a lot easier. And again, you can be a lot more focused. You can spend a lot more time and effort and energy and emotion, your team uh, investment into those few where to play arenas in developing this stuff up. And so the focus and clarity piece comes into play again. Here. Now guys, I know we're, I know we're at, uh, we are at time. We're going to definitely go 15 minutes over. It was ridiculously optimistic of me to think that I could get the Don to do what is normally done over a one to two day strategy workshop done down into an hour. So clearly that was never going to happen. There is 15 minutes of probably at least 15 minutes left. Um, there is some absolute gold stuff coming up, especially when you start to look at this activity system and core capability bit. If you can stick around, that would be awesome. If you can't, remember we're recording the session um, and there'll be an email that goes out tomorrow with the link to the template that the Don's providing everybody for free as well. Uh, and keep firing those questions through. If we don't get time to answer them today, which is highly unlikely, I might get the Don just to record a quick um, video answer that we can share it with everybody as well. So. I'll give it back to Steve to keep moving. Yeah, thanks, mate. So um, the next uh, the next choice you make is around playing to your strengths. So what what are the capabilities that you need to deliver to continue to live, deliver your how to wins that you've chosen um, where you've selected to play? And so this is around how to build up your required capability muscles. Um, and this is a first exercise. First part of this is. Uh, understanding you have an activity system and it, within that activity system you have a bunch of usually somewhere between three and five what I call core capabilities yep so the higher order core capabilities and if we go to that next slide Steve might be the, the best way to describe this which is the activity system map if you like what I've done is populated five uh, core capabilities which are common core capabilities, but, but by no means the only core capabilities that businesses, financial advice businesses have, just some of the, um, just some of the, the common ones. But to give you a view of this, right, it's to say, if you can identify the core capabilities in your business, those that you really want to invest in or continue to invest in because they're currently strengths, but those that you might want to build up muscle strength with over time, then it's the connectivity of those core capabilities in your activity system that will feed off and invest in each other through the activities, which are represented by the smaller oval shapes around those core capabilities. So all of the things that you do. So in advice and service, you know, it's SOA production, it's research, it's, it's client reviews. It's all of the things that you do, the activities that, that invest in this higher order advice and service delivery core capability. But here's the trick. If you can invest a dollar in any activity, anything that you do in your business, how can you leverage that dollar? How can you turn that dollar into 10 of value capture somewhere else in the, in the activity system? How could you turn that dollar of investment into a hundred bucks? How could you invest that dollar and turn it into a thousand dollars of value capture somewhere in there? Well, the, the way you do that is if you're choosing activities that invest in mul mostly investing in multiple of your core capabilities, then there's every chance that uh, each of the core capabilities individually are getting stronger. But importantly, your activity system as a whole is getting stronger. The set and the configuration of your core capabilities and activities means that you can turn a dollar into tens or hundreds or thousands of multiples in value capture. What does that translate into over time? That translates into profit. I can tell you that your, most of your competitors have no clue how this works. Um, this can be one of your strongest competitive advantages, interestingly, as you think about the activities that you choose to do and the core capabilities that you, you look to build up and continue to invest in over time. So, Steve, um, do you want me to seeing as seeing as this is 
uh, this is our activity system. Uh, do you want me to just give one example of how you forced me to think through this thing? Because the first time he made me do this, it hurt my head like a lot. Yeah. Um, the one to one I got, and the, I'll turn the I'll turn the camera back on. The the one to one I got, the one to ten I started to get through, but the whole one to a hundred and one to a thousand thing, I was like, this is bullshit. This is just strategy. Mumbo jumbo, it's what you blokes say to make us think that you're all intelligent, but it's garbage, right? And so I've gone, okay, well, this isn't going to work. But then I thought, what? It, let's just believe it for a second and work through it. So one example was um, virtual meetings to video and how we use that in the advice process. So that's an activity system. Uh, it ties into innovation with a Gen Y and Gen X client base. Their preferred engagement model based on our research was option to meet face to face but ongoing was virtual and video was their number one preference there's no point schlepping it from one side of town to the other if they don't need to so that was the innovation bit that also then tied into target market knowledge and client understanding target market knowledge is what do they want from us client understanding was what do we know about them when we're working with them uh, initially we only did our virtual and our video stuff to tie into um, our budgeting and cash flow. But now in our advice business, we use virtual for pretty much everything. We use video to deliver videos around insurance advice prior to statements of advice. Our clients get videos part of the annual review process. They get videos. Um, and then we've used our video capability to, to very poorly, but at this stage we're starting to do a video series which launches into the brand building, which will then convert into an online course. So this is where the Steve says, well, it's the one to thousand. Initially it was done to make it easier for us to do meetings with clients. And then we've gone, well, how else do we do that? That then informed us switching from go to meeting, which was terrible at the recording part into zoom, which we can use for audio recording and other stuff like that. So he's right when he told, I mean, this stuff looks like it could be all spooky magic, but when you sit down and actually understand what you're trying to do behind it, it does force you to strategically think through the options and the decisions that you've got available to you. Spot on, Steve. Thank you. Um, there are lots and lots of real life examples, um, you know, around this stuff. And Steve's just given one, one example of, of how this can work and, and it does work. Um, and at some point I'm happy to share more of this information with, uh, with those who are, um, who are viewing this today. But just on that slide then, the final action uh, then just to kick this ball into play, what would you identify as the, the top three core capabilities of your firm today? So have a think about that, um, jot them down and start to think about, well, okay, here are my top three core capabilities. Are these what I need to continue to invest in going forward? Um, what do I need to invest in more what other capabilities are there that i need to build up that i need for my future that i need to develop up or expand um, and so this uh, action is to start that kick that ball into play what are your currently your top three core capabilities so we get to the final choice um, uh, in this exercise in this framework and that is managing what matters so communication of the strategy is really really important but communication is one thing the bigger issue is yes communicate but do people understand? Um, I'll show you in a sec a, a, a one-page success strategy success statement, which at some point when it's completed, you can share with everyone on the team, do a QA, and a get everyone to understand the rationale, uh, why you made the choices you did, uh, and get them to talk about that and to understand it. So uh, strategy for those most successful businesses starts with the most junior person in the firm and bubbles up. Um, Strategy for those businesses that uh, are okay and, and will be okay uh, often is just okay. Um, that'll start from the genius or the geniuses at the top who try to trickle stuff down as deeply as they possibly can. And the reality is it never reaches uh, the inner sanctums of the business. Um, so the reality is how do you communicate it? Use the success statement, really powerful. When you do your quarterly reviews, you'll update it. Give the new version of the success statement to your team. With a, with a quick briefing, they're always ahead, they're always uh, on, on point with where the strategy is at and why it's, it's, it's the way it is. Um, the other interesting thing I did mention, you do quarterly reviews of your strategy, that's really important to do that. Don't do it once a year or every two years. 
you just lose all the opportunities of stuff and you're not actually getting across the things that you need to be across. Um, the execution piece, which I mentioned earlier, um, there's four disciplines. If you follow these four disciplines of execution, um, this is going to help you enormously. It's a part of the strategy activation plan, which I'll get to in a second. But basically it's, what's the one winning move? What's the one winning strategic move that if you focused all of your efforts and your team's efforts on the one thing, what would that be? And how might we put the collective effort behind that and nail that as soon as we possibly can? So what's that one winning move, the thing that would move the dial for your business significantly that would help you accelerate towards the success that you want in the future? Let's get that one thing done. Don't pick 10 things and try and do them all at once. That's a recipe for disaster. Uh, it never works and people, businesses wonder why they're not getting any traction. And that's often the reason why they're just over committing to things that they can never ever really get to and get too well. Um, so focus on the one winning move. Then you act on the lead measures. So what are the things, the activities that you need to do that will actually deliver your, uh, your one thing, your one winning move? So focus on those lead measures. There might only be a handful of those, but they're critical. And the activities and the tasks that are involved in those things, they're what we've really got to focus on doing. Then thirdly, keep a compelling scoreboard. Everyone in the business needs to know where we're up to in the game of nailing this one winning move. Uh, we need to know where we're at, progressed to with each of the lead measures, how we're tracking, are we getting closer to delivery? What are some of the hurdles? What are some of the barriers? Why have we stopped in a particular spot on something? Everyone in the business needs to have access to the scoreboard. It's like anything, right? We're playing a game, we want to win. We need to be able to look up at the scoreboard occasionally and go, we're in front, so we need to keep going in a particular way. Uh, it's a bit of a struggle, so we need to think that through what we need to do in the remainder of the game, or we're well behind, so something needs to change. The strategy needs to get changed up. Um, the fourth element of the discipline of execution is create a rhythm of accountability. And by that I mean, Really simple, you might have the one winning move, the exercise around that, the lead measures. Uh, you might have three or four people who are involved in executing to that. Um, have a weekly meeting. Everyone commits to maybe one or two things that they're gonna do each week to advance um, the one winning move forward. Um, they report on that at the weekly meeting, just a quick meeting. How'd you go with this thing, Steve? Did you do that? Yep, nailed that, moving on, next thing. Great, what are you going to do next week? Well, I'm going to do this bit next week. Great. And so the weekly meetings are creating a rhythm of accountability. People turn up who are involved in that project. People turn up to those meetings. They know what they committed to last week. Did they do it? Yes or no. If they didn't, then we will work out how we do it next week. Um, if they did, great. What's the next thing we're going to work on? And so that rhythm of accountability becomes really, really important. That's the way to start thinking about execution excellence. And with firms that I work with, that's the way we start going about doing things. And it's amazing how things change, um, how the whole view of the world, whilst individuals are working through the whirlwind of their day to day, they're also actually getting some seriously important stuff done as well uh, from a strategic point of view. So the action item from this final choice is around uh, list three measures linked to, the, linked to the delivery of your firm's revenue. So I've taken revenue as a key KPI, which probably affects all of you. Uh, what are the three lead measures linked to the delivery of your firm's revenue target for FYE uh, 19? <clears throat> so this is a current issue, current matter, but I want you to think through what those lead measures are. And we start to think about the lead measures that are important for us as we start to build our strategy going forward. Just very quickly, knowing your numbers, um, your goals, well, they're around the KPIs you set. If it's revenue, if it's profit, if it's a certain number of clients, if it's you're going to do a certain number of client surveys, if there's particular where to play client uh, metrics and numbers and, uh, that your targets you want to hit, then what are the key performance indicators for your business? And then what are the lead measures for those? So what are the things that are going that you do that are going to influence the delivery of those numbers? So really important that you know your numbers and in fact that we include your current targets, your current year targets in the, uh, the success statement, which I'll show you in a second. So 
action item from this is refresh your firm's KPIs for the balance of this year, this financial year, and establish some KPI forecasts for FYE 22, so three years out, and FYE 25, um, another two years out beyond that. Um, let's get kick those numbers into play, and that's going to help again as you frame up your strategy. That's going to help you think through what it is that you you need to be doing. Activating your strategy well, it's about launching your one winning move. And so, Steve, if we go to the next slide, we might just kick straight into it. Here's your strategy activation plan. This is uh, this is the template you you can use now, um, and this is how to think about it set up. And the setup is pretty simple. It's really around. Okay, what is the one winning move? Amongst all of the, the high, potentially, you might have a list of high priority strategic things you want to do, but you've got to pick one. You've got to pick the most important one winning move at this moment in time. Uh, we identify what it is, the rationale behind choosing it. We give, someone gets to own it. The owner doesn't do all the work necessarily, but someone needs to own it from a responsibility point of view. We need to know when we want to land this thing by and we put in a hard date. Uh, and then we also want to think about, well, okay, who else is gonna work with us on this thing to help deliver it? We never lose all of the other things that we need to do because as soon as we finish this one winning move, as soon as we, we execute it, we, we deliver it, we implement it, then we move next, we move quickly to the next most important strategic move or winning move on your list. So we're, in, we're ending up with a series of one winning moves, not 10 winning moves all at once. As I said earlier, it's craziness, never really works. If we go to the next slide, Steve, so focus on the one winning move, then we need to act on the lead measures. So we need to identify what those lead measures are, who owns each of those lead measures that's gonna help us deliver it, by when do we want their pieces done, and any other comments that we need to make around, well, okay, what do we need to consider? Who needs to get involved? Who's doing what with stuff? So we need to act on the lead measures because it's the lead measures that ultimately will deliver our piece, our one winning move. The third slide, the next slide, Steve, that we have is we've got to maintain a compelling scoreboard. So we each need to, everyone in the business needs to know where they can get this, where they can see it. Some might put this stuff into a, into a chart or bar graph. You can be creative with how you create your scoreboard or simply put it into a spreadsheet that people can get access to. And so what's the lead measure? We're uh, reconfirming who the owner is, what the status of it is. So we can quickly look at that. Um, we've got the dates by when again, we've confirmed those dates. Any issues that have come up that we need to consider, any other comments that we need to, we need to make. So people in your team, and I mean everyone in your team, need to, within 15, 20 seconds of looking at this thing, know exactly where we're at with this one winning move. And maybe someone can put their hand up and go, you know what, I can help you with part of that. Or here's something that might help this. Here's a roadblock I think I might be able to do, to do something to, to overcome that. So the scoreboard is really, really important. And the fourth slide, Steve, which is to create a rhythm of accountability. So what we're doing is we're getting to these meetings. What were the tasks from last week? What were they? Uh, we've registered what they were. What were the outcomes? So Sky, Forest and Brook are reporting on what they were going to do. Um, uh, they've put their, their outcomes in there. There was a did not complete one. Um, so that's going to roll over into the next week. Um, and so again, the accountability of this weekly meeting, we turn up, we make a commitment, we do it the next week, we report on it, we make a commitment, we do it the next week, and we just get this rhythm of accountability moving. Really, really important. You can get stuff delivered. You can execute brilliantly if you just follow these four simple uh, activities, these four simple disciplines. Okay, final piece is um, for me, just to give you an idea of what the uh, one page success statement looks like. So this is your strategy on a page effectively. Um, this is a tool that obviously you can get, you can take, you can keep, and more importantly, you should use. And you can use this, uh, this becomes your communication tool, it becomes your review tool, the basis of your review, your quarterly reviews of your strategy. It's a tool you can use to help brief stakeholders in exercises, those who can help you deliver what you need to deliver, 
share this with them. This is an education piece for them. Um, and why you've chosen the where to play arenas, why you have the importance of your how to wins, how they might be able to help uh, support those as well. So on a page, pretty much you've got your vision, you've identified some core values, the really important things that form the basis of your culture, the things that will never change, the guiding purpose, um, the, uh, the win with client guiding purpose. So it's the outcomes that um, your clients will receive uh, after doing business with you or from doing business with you, not what you are and what, how good you are and what you do. You've got some KPIs in there as around your goals in the current year. That keeps everyone sort of focused on that as we do the regular reporting as we do on our numbers. We've got our two, in this case, our two chosen where to play, our focused and clear where to play arenas. We don't have seven where to play arenas. We have two in this case. And with each of those where to play arenas, we have a matched pair of how to wins. So how to wins for arena one specifically and how to wins for arena two. They're not doubled up. They're not uh, in there as where to play, uh, how to wins for the same how to wins for both arenas. They are unique and distinctive to each of those where to play arenas. And then obviously the things that we want to measure, we've put on there as well, the key things that we want to measure towards achieving our goals and our KPIs. And we've also identified and stated our core capabilities, again, to keep those front of mind. How are we choosing activities to do, which invest in multiples of those core capabilities? Doesn't happen every time you do an activity, but the more activities you can do that actually invest in multiple of your core capabilities is where the strategic art form uh, comes from. So, that's what we end up with after doing the exercise. Really clear, really focused um, communication to everyone in the team. They can start to live and breathe this stuff through the work that they do, through the job that they have. Um, really, really good way to set up for your future success. And there you have it. Uh, in a one hour and 23 minute nutshell, um, which is still pretty good for him and for anyone named Steve. Steve's a notorious at going over time. Um, but hopefully the 13 of you that have stuck around for the full show have had an enormous amount of value. Um, any questions, feel free to fire them through in the chat box in the last couple of seconds and I'll get the Don, Steve, to... Uh, to um, record uh, an answer to that and fire it through with the final recorded version. Um, obviously I put the link to the toolkit taste, uh, which was that strategy action plan um, template. All you needed to do is click the link. That is all yours. And now if you want to help us and help Steve um, find someone to look after the dog to, to keep it out of, <laughs> out of the video. Uh, I haven't seen the dog sneak in there. I'm not exactly sure how he got in, but I'll uh, just shoot He's, that he's crafty. Um, is you can join us at Let's Talk More Action 19 in February next year, where Steve will be host. Where Steve will be one of our coaches, so he'll be doing day one talking about the theory, uh, similar to this but not exactly the same. Day two, probably picking out two or three of the key roadblocks that stop businesses from developing a winning strategy, and then starting to build that out, and then spending more time in the coach's corner doing one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and one to many coaching, helping you start the build of your stuff. And then obviously we're going to have the online course. Steve's got the online course as well. Um, so anyone that's done any of my courses knows, especially when it comes to the, you know, what's the, um, what business problem are you trying to solve and what does your clients look like? You get an understanding of where that comes from. This is Steve's stuff. He obviously takes it to a whole nother level. Um, so even if you've done one of my courses, I can strongly encourage you to do his because it basically fills out all the stuff that I sucked at, um, which was all of the implementation strategic stuff, KPIs, accountability, the things that make my head hurt, but are clearly the things that are bloody critical and need to be done. Um, I thank Steve for joining us. Uh, I thank all of you for hanging out. Um, until next time, we won't have one in, uh, in January or Feb. Our next one won't be till March. Uh, we might do one in January, depending on how we go, but highly unlikely. Hope to see you all at LTMA. Thanks for joining us uh, today and, and tonight. Uh, and until next time, thanks, Steve. Um, thanks. thanks, everyone. Thanks, and, Steve. Uh, and bye for now. Cheers.